Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering ACA reporting, how to prepare for 2024 changes. I'm Brianna Hostler, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full-service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I am excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Paul Corellis. Paul has over a decade of experience in the HR consulting space, working with businesses of all sizes and industries. Paul leads a team of SHRM certified HR professionals at MP. Together, they assist clients with compliance, training, and HR guidance and support for the full employee life cycle. Paul also spearheads MP's employee retention tax credit services. This initiative has helped thousands of clients claim over $100 million in refundable, advanceable tax credits. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today along with the slides. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Paul. Awesome, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Looking forward to talking about this yet again. This is a, an annual tradition, albeit not the most fun or exciting one, but an important one nonetheless. So. Um, let's dig right in. We've got a lot to cover. <clears throat> so, today, we'll obviously be talking about the ACA or the Affordable Care Act. Um, we'll do a quick overview, a little bit of background and history, just so that we're all on the same page. We'll talk about the due dates as well as the penalties, and there are some changes to those penalties for this year and next. We'll go over some of the biggest changes, both those affecting um, this compliance year where the filing will be occurring early in 2024, as well as some changes for the 2024 calendar year. We'll talk a little bit about penalty letters. The IRS um, has gotten better about keeping relatively up to date on those and sending those out. So if you do run into the unfortunate instance of, of receiving a, a letter from the federal government about a potential ACA violation, we'll guide you through how to best respond to that. We'll take a quick look at some of the ACA reports um, that iSolved has available, and we'll do our best to leave some time for, for Q&A as well. So just a very quick history lesson for those of you who may be new to the Affordable Care Act. It was originally signed into law by President Barack Obama in March of 2010. Um, it was challenged and uh, advanced all the way to the Supreme Court, where it was largely upheld. Um, in 2012, 2015, and in 2021. When it was first released, it, it, it was widely understood that this was a big undertaking. Um, for someone like me that sits in Massachusetts, we were a little bit used to it from some Massachusetts specific healthcare reform that occurred a few years prior, um, but for the rest of the country, this was brand new stuff. So the nice thing about it was they did implement it gradually. <clears throat> Uh, but some of the things that did come about as a result of the Affordable Care Act was, and some things that still exist today, guaranteed insurance coverage for folks with pre-existing conditions, um, automatic coverage for children on a family health plan up to age 26, uh, lactation breaks for nursing mothers, so it also delved into some employment law there, no lifetime coverage limits on a health insurance plan, Free with no out-of-pocket costs, preventative care screenings, annual physicals, and things like that. And then also a rule for group health plans that the waiting period for eligible new hires can exceed 90 days. Um, one major change that did occur to the ACA about five years ago was prior to that. So for the first several years of the Affordable Care Act, there was what was known as the individual mandate, where if an individual did not have health insurance for themselves, uh, when it came time to filing their personal income taxes, there were penalties in place for folks who did not carry adequate coverage. Um, that was repealed, so there is no longer a federal government penalty for individuals who choose not to 
uh, partake in health insurance. There are some states that do have individual mandates, so you want to be mindful of that. But in terms of the federal mandate, that is gone. All right, so let's talk about some, some changes before we go into the bread and butter of it all. So first things first, there are increases in the penalties, uh, both for the non-offer penalty as well as the affordability violation. We'll go over those in just a few minutes. So those are increasing both for this year, 2023, and also increasing in 2024. So uh, we'll go over those numbers momentarily. One thing to note, um, we're going to talk about affordability and, and what your responsibility as, is as an employer to your employees to ensure that you're offering affordable coverage. Um, one thing to anticipate, especially as you're planning your perhaps your open enrollment, a lot of people do have plan years that start and line up with the calendar year. Um, but whatever stage you're in, you're going to want to take a look at this change for the 2024 plan year. There is a fairly dramatic decrease in the allowable measure of affordability for health plans to be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act. So as it stands for this year, the employee out-of-pocket cost for the employee-only lowest eligible plan um, cannot exceed 9.12% of their income. And we'll go over the various safe harbors towards the end of the presentation today. So that's, that's the affordability marker for 2023. Next year, that's going to drop all the way down to 8.39%, which means if your employee's out-of-pocket costs for the cheapest available employee-only health plan that you offer exceeds 8.39% of their income, then that's technically going to be considered unaffordable. So um, if you've shopped rates at all at any time this year or been taking a look at 2024, you know that the cost to employers is is going up and going up fairly significantly. Uh, unfortunately, the affordability measure is, is going in the opposite direction. So it's a bit of a double whammy for employers as they're facing increased health insurance costs. Um, their onus to, to meet the affordability thresholds is getting more difficult. So we'll talk about that more a little bit, but that is a really significant change you need to be mindful of. They're also changing when we go over the due dates. There used to be a due date for paper filing of electronic forms and, and folks who are filing less than 250 forms had previously been allowed to file via paper rather than electronically. Um, as of the upcoming filing in early 2024, that is no longer allowed unless you're filing less than 10 forms. And um, I can't say that I've ever seen that in, in my career here uh, just because the threshold for being subject to the ACA is, is 50 or more full-time equivalents. So unless you had a really unique setup where you had a ton of part-time individuals and fewer than 10 full-time workers over the course of a year, um, in most cases, you're going to need to file electronically if you're not already. If you're an MP client and, and on the ISOL platform and all, we take care of that electronic filing. Um, but if you're doing it on your own or doing it in-house or, or working with another provider, uh, you'll just want to make sure that you're filing electronically to avoid any unnecessary penalties. Um, one other thing that we'll, we'll get into on the next slide is that the marketplace rules have been, been relaxed and relaxed fairly significantly. Um, there was this kind of family glitch for a while where if, if one member of a household had an offer of coverage uh, from their employer, then a lot of times that would knock out the rest of the family from, from getting a, a, a subsidized coverage on the marketplace. That's been corrected also when it comes to changes in eligibility, um, marriages, divorce, births, all of that. Um, in most cases now, the the user just needs to attest about the change. They don't need to submit proof or verification. So that obviously creates a, an easier pathway to getting marketplace insurance through healthcare.gov and, and some other measures too. So they've done a lot to really encourage folks um, who are exploring their options or maybe without options from an employer to go to healthcare.gov. And um, we'll talk about some statistics there, but needless to say, enrollments are way up. One thing that, that's kind of an update from last year, but is, is still important to, to note is that the good faith standard is, is officially dead. So previously, um, and it was actually something baked into the regulations. It wasn't just like we sometimes talk about with a good faith 
effort going a long way when it comes to compliance with the federal government. There were actually good faith provisions in the original ACA regulations, meaning that if you were making a, an honest effort to offer insurance to the folks that you felt were eligible and for the most part did a good job of it, you know, they would often overlook or minimize honest mistakes. Um, obviously that's different than someone saying, hey, I know I'm subject, but I refuse to offer health insurance. You know, th those are still treated harshly, but in most cases there was a little bit of wiggle room for people making an honest effort. So those are, are no longer observed. Certainly the IRS may decide to provide leniency to someone, but in terms of what they're saying, at least on paper, um, they expect everyone at this point to be in full compliance and give themselves the right to penalize to the maximum published rates and amounts um, if there is a violation. They did also last year um, for the 2023 filing year and beyond uh, allow for a permanent change to the due dates, which is a bit of good news and a, a lot of bad news we're seeing here on this slide um, that does give employers a little bit more flexibility. And, and to be honest, the way it had worked historically was they would have these earlier due dates and then every year and right around now, they would announce that they were going to push those due dates back to a easier date for employers. Um, so they just decided to make that permanent, which was a big relief for us. All right. So speaking of that marketplace coverage, uh, the White House just last week um, released some statistics. So the open enrollment period on the marketplace opened on November 1st. Um, so it's been up for about two weeks. Uh, the data that they released was just for the first week of enrollment from November 1st through November 8th. Um, first, they mentioned last year. So there was record-breaking healthcare.gov marketplace enrollment in 2023. 16.3 million people obtained health insurance coverage through the marketplace last year. In the first week of open enrollment, so again, that first week, full week of November, 1.6 million people have enrolled. And they said that includes 300, I think it was actually 301,000 new enrollees. So people who hadn't previously obtained insurance through healthcare.gov have did so in the first week of November this year. Um, that first week measure is a 50% increase from the first week in 2023's open enrollment. So a significant bump there. Um, they also said that, um, based on their findings and their research, that four out of five shoppers on healthcare.gov can find a plan that would cost less than $10 per month per person. I'm not sure of the quality of that coverage or, or what that would include um, or, or what states that that would be, um, but that is is directly from, from the White House. One other note in terms of the marketplace, so a number of folks who were receiving Medicaid during the COVID health emergency um, lost that coverage. Um, that is, has now gone back. So there are many, many folks who were on Medicaid during the you know, federally observed health emergency due to COVID. Um, they've lost that coverage. Those folks have until July 24th of next year um, to enroll in coverage through, through the marketplace. All right, so um, let's just go over some key terms. I'll try my best not to use abbreviations and industry lingo and things like that. If I do, forgive me. Um, but just some things you might come across when you're reading about the ACA or reading reports or, or talking with a broker, whatever it may be. Just want to make sure we we're all speaking the same language here. So first term you may hear is ALE. That stands for Applicable Large Employer. So ALEs are the folks who need to be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act. Um, what that basically means that is that in the previous calendar year, you had 50 or more FTEs, which stands for full-time equivalent employees. So the ACA's definition of an FTE is an individual who regularly works 30 or more hours per week. Um, now, Definition of FTE and definition of employer size really varies from program to program. For those of you who recently did the ERTC, the Employee Retention Tax Credit, you may have worked with us or even with me on that. Um, the definition of employer size and, and full-time employee was, was a little bit different. So with the ERTC, you didn't have to count part-timers at all. You just looked at your actual full-time employee count. With the ACA, you do have to look at everybody. So. Um, if you do have part-timers, you do have to factor in their average hours. 
Um, in the simplest terms, basically, uh, if you have two employees averaging 15 hours or more per week, that would count as one FTE. Now, those individuals are part-time, so you don't necessarily have to offer them insurance. But when it comes to determining the size of your business and whether or not you're an ALE, um, those part-timers do count towards that total. There is also an important category to take note of, and that's a variable hour employee. So for those individuals, you need to be able to attest and, and sometimes attest under oath that you can't reasonably determine whether or not they're going to be full-time or part-time when they start. There are special rules and flexibilities for variable hour employees. Um, certainly, they're, they're more accepted in hospitality and retail, other professions where you, you tend to have a lot of variable hour employees. You are given a separate measurement period for those folks. You can give yourself up to 12 months to take a look at their at their average hours to determine whether or not they're going to be full time and eligible for benefits. Again, I can't stress enough, you do not want to abuse that. Um, if you are audited, they will look at that very closely and, and really determine whether or not that employee was variable hour or if you were abusing the system and, and just waiting a year to offer someone benefits that you knew you were going to have to anyway. <laughs> A few more key terms. Um, first is the measurement or the look back period. Next is the stability period. And third is the administrative period. So there is some flexibility in terms of how you manage your ACA compliance and, and who you have to offer insurance to. So one key measure is, is the measurement period. Um, I would say most employers, um, not all, but, but many, use a 12-month look-back period and will usually align it with their open enrollment. So you're looking back at the previous 12 months to see how many hours on average employees worked. You can have shorter measurement periods as well. Um, some folks will even go so far as to having a monthly measurement period. Um, but the, the shorter that you make your measurement period, the more administratively burdensome your ACA compliance is going to be. Because once you do that measurement period, um, you're then going to have to offer people coverage who fell above the full-time threshold and potentially COBRA out people who fell below and who had been on the insurance. Um, so again, definitely speak with a broker, an HR professional, legal counsel if appropriate, um, any trusted advisors when it comes to determining the best ACA measurement period for you. I will say, administratively speaking, the 12 month is, is going to be your most straightforward and easiest to manage. Um, but obviously, there are different situations for different industries and different employers. So take some time to think about what's best for you. The stability period is basically needs to be at least as long as your measurement period. Um, for, for folks using short, there, there are some minimums to stability periods. But um, in most cases, it needs to be at least as long as the measurement period, which means that once you look back and let's say you're using your your 12 month look back period, whoever meets that that full time measure then has a matching 12 month stability period. So even if their hours fluctuate in that following year, they're in a stability period. And because the previous 12 months they were full time in terms of their hours, they're guaranteed health insurance coverage for that entire 12 months following. There is also an allowable administrative period. Um, those That is the time period which you have to run your open enrollment, do your measurements, um, notify employees that they're eligible or that they're no longer eligible. Um, so you, you wanna manage that carefully as well. So we've talked about this quite a bit already, so I won't belabor it. Um, but when I say the marketplace or say the exchange, what I'm referring to are, are the programs either at the federal government level, which is healthcare.gov, or a growing number of states who run their own insurance exchanges. Um, where I sit in Massachusetts, that's the Massachusetts Health Connector. Um, other states have other programs. Some states declined to often offer their own exchange or marketplace. Um, when an employee goes on to healthcare.gov and enters in their information and where they live, it will either direct them to their state exchange, or if their state doesn't have one, it will have them proceed through healthcare.gov. So 
um, from a 10,000 foot view, your responsibilities, if, if you've determined that you're an ALE, um, you need to offer coverage to at least 95% of eligible employees. Um, and this number needs to be updated. This is a outdated number there, but that offer of coverage that you do offer, um, the lowest cost employee only plan must not exceed um, the affordability measure, which is 9.12% of their household income. And we'll get into how you how you measure that momentarily. All right, so for 2024 due dates, you wanna take note of these. The 1095 forms, so those are a unique form that each full-time employee that you have will receive that talks about their specific offer of coverage. Those are due to employees by March 1st, 2024. Um, if you have employees in California or Rhode Island, they have state specific requirements that require you to furnish those forms to employees in those states by January 31st. So if you don't have employees in California or Rhode Island, you have until March 1st of next year to get them their 1095 Cs. Um, otherwise for those two states, it is the end of January in line with W-2. As I said before, the paper filing with the IRS is no longer allowed. The electronic filing is due by April 1st of 2024. If you do need an extension past that April 1st date, you're gonna wanna file what's called Form 8809. Um, that will grant you an extension from your due date. If you are a client of MP um, and on iSolved, we ask that you please approve your ACA forms in the system by January 17th. That'll guarantee that we can get them to you prior to January 31st. So if you have, again, employees in California, Rhode Island, do make sure you approve the forms in ISOL by January 17th. Um, if you're looking at the later deadline, the absolute drop dead date to guarantee that you have the 1095 forms delivered to you in time to get to the employees and guarantee delivery by March 1st is February 5th. So there will be a year-end letter with all the various dates and deadlines at MP coming soon. Um, but in terms of ACA, these, these are our current due dates. Um, and I spoke with a member of the team here this morning, and she said that the forms should be available in ISOL to start approving on January 2nd, 2024. All right, let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about potential penalties. So the first penalty we'll talk about is what's known as the non-offer penalty. And this this is really can be the expensive one. So uh, the non-offer penalty is triggered when an employer does not offer coverage to an employee who was eligible and should have been offered coverage. The penalty is triggered when an employee gets marketplace coverage and receives a subsidy on that coverage. And, and the way that the rules have changed, again, we're seeing record participation in healthcare.gov. So, you know, if, if you're not offering coverage to your employees and no one signs up for a health plan and no one gets you know, a, a discount on that plan from the government, then there's nothing to trigger a penalty. But I will say that more and more employees are eligible for discounts and more and more employees are signing up. For healthcare through the exchange. So the risk is, is much greater than it was even say five years ago. So if you don't offer coverage to someone that you should have and someone goes and gets a plan that's subsidized on healthcare.gov, you are then going to face a penalty based on your entire FTE count. So the penalty for 2023 is $2,880 per full-time employee minus the first 30. So if you're, for example purposes, have 100 full-time equivalent employees and you violate the non-offer penalty provisions of the ACA, the lop off the first 30, which leaves you at 70 FTEs. Oh, I got to update. I did do the math correctly. I just didn't update the number. 2750 was the penalty amount for 2022. Um, but if you do that 70 times the 2880, um, you will be facing a penalty of $201,600. So 
definitely a hairy amount of money that I'm sure none of us want to pay to the federal government if we don't need to. They do prorate the penalty. So if the employee, say, only gets coverage for six of those 12 months, um, or you had an offer of coverage for six of those 12 months in that instance, the penalty would be half of that amount, so $100,000. Um, but if you do violate, the, the full 12-month penalty would be that 2016 number. As I said, when it comes to the changes, those numbers are rising. So it's going to be going from 2,880 this year to 2,970 next year. So again, increasing penalties there. The next potential penalty is the affordability. So this would be an instance where you did offer coverage to the folks that you were supposed to, but that offer of coverage and the lowest cost employee only option um, did not meet the affordability safe harbors would trigger this penalty. So again, um, if everyone signs up for the insurance, even if it's not affordable, you're, you won't be penalized for that. The penalties would only occur if someone declines cover that coverage from you, which is deemed to be unaffordable, and then goes to healthcare.gov and, and receives a subsidized plan. This penalty does not take into account the full number of FTEs that you have on, on staff. It only counts the actual employees receiving the subsidized coverage. So in our 100 FTE company example, if four full-time four full-time employees are receive an offer of coverage that is not deemed affordable, and they all go to healthcare.gov and receive subsidized coverage, the penalty in this case would be four times 4,320, or a grand total of 17,280. Again, not a number to brush off by any means, but a lot less than the non-offer penalty. This penalty amount is also gonna be increasing next year. Um, from 4,320 to 4,460. So not as much of an increase, but an increase nonetheless. There are were also some upticks in the penalties for failure to file the forms that we're gonna go over momentarily. So if you file your 1094 and 1095 forms late, you can be penalized up to $290 per form with a maximum penalty for late filing of up to $3 million. As you can imagine, that adds up. In most cases, you're filing 50 or more, 1095. So each one of those carries a potential $290 penalty. That's up, I believe, $10 from last year. It was $280 per form last year. Um, if the government deems that you intentionally failed to file ACA forms, so again, maybe the instance of the employer who decided they're just not going to offer group health coverage, even though they have more than 50 full-time equivalents. Um, in those instances where they feel it's malicious, they reserve the right to penalize up to $580 per form with no cap. And that's that's up significantly. I think it was $380 per form last year. So um, that's a, a pretty big bump. So... Make sure you file and file on time. Hopefully none of you are familiar with the term 226J. Um, if you are, hope it worked out well for you. Um, if you do see one in the future, don't panic. Um, so letter 226J is kind of the initial letter that the IRS will send you if they feel you may have a potential ACA penalty. Um, a lot of times this can be a, a misunderstanding. It, it might be that you are not of the size to be subject to ACA, um, but the government might think that you are for some reason. So um, they send you this letter. It might be that when the employee went to healthcare.gov and filled out the questionnaire, they signify that they didn't receive an offer of coverage from you for insurance or that um, they didn't receive an affordable offer when when you look at the numbers and you have proof, preferably via a waiver that they signed, uh, as well as the the figures that you did offer them affordable coverage, um, in which case they wouldn't have been eligible for that subsidy and then you're not penalized. There, there are many instances where you may receive one of these letters. A lot of times they will come up with a number. Um, sometimes I can honestly say, I don't know where they, where they came up with these numbers. They're usually very, very inflated, 
uh, but they'll come up with a proposed number and let's say they'll, they'll send a letter and say, we feel you, you may have violated the ACA. These three employees receive subsidized coverage um, based on the information we have, we're determining that your penalty may be $250,000. They do give you the opportunity if if you want to agree with those findings to, to send them a check in response. Um, I do not advise doing that. Uh, there is usually a relatively short window to respond to these, um, usually somewhere between 10 days and two weeks. So you don't want to sit on these letters. Uh, you do want to get jump right into action on them. Um, but, but do look over all the information. Again, more often than not, we found that, you know, the employer own, owes very little, if anything at all, and most times they owe nothing. So don't be scared by the numbers that they, they send over. What you will want to do is reach out to your payroll provider during that time period, get the statistics. Again, hopefully you have a waiver if they, if they didn't take coverage through you to show that you did offer the coverage and they declined it. Um, you're going to want to have open enrollment da data. So especially if, if you do electronic open enrollment, uh, you should be able to pull reports to show that they declined the coverage as well. You're most likely going to need to pull some payroll data if it's a question of affordability so that you can show which safe harbor you used and why the offer was affordable. And then you're going to want to write a formal response to kind of dispute their initial findings. Definitely recommend getting help with that. Uh, you want to make sure you word everything correctly, that you're correct in your findings, and that you... Um, lay it out in a way that will hopefully get this all wiped away for you. So you'll send that off and while they only give you a couple of weeks to respond, they oftentimes take much longer to come back with their follow-up response. So do be patient, just make sure you get in by the deadline and await the response. And uh, again, you know, if you've got the proof, if you've got the data, if you've got the documentation, there really isn't much to worry about um, and you should be okay. All right, so let's talk about precisely what those reporting requirements are. So there are two sections of the IRS code that um, outline an employee's reporting requirements. So what's known as code 6056 requires applicable large employers to provide an annual statement to each full-time employee detailing the employer's health coverage offer. So that's the 1095C. Code 6055 um, requires that if you are self-funded or self-insured, um, there are different 1095 forms that you may need to provide to your covered employees. Um, if you do have some level of self-insurance, you're just going to want to talk to your health broker or the carrier, whoever you do it with, because we found that each provider runs things a little bit differently. Some put more onus on the employer to provide forms to employees. Some do a lot of the work for you and a lot of the heavy lifting. You're just gonna wanna make sure you know who's doing what so that you don't fall out of compliance and become subject to some of these penalties we just talked about. So what is the argument and the purpose for, for these reporting requirements? Um, so first, it helps determine which employees are eligible for subsidies um, and which aren't. Um, and also outlines any employer that may feel, be failing to offer affordable minimum value coverage to the employees that should be eligible. So you do see uh, a few more definitions here. The first of which is minimum essential coverage. So within the language of the Affordable Care Act, which is several hundred pages, um, they basically have requirements for, in order for a, a health plan that you offer to be suitable and meet your requirements under the Affordable Care Act, there, there are certain levels of coverage that have to be met. So as long as you're working with a reputable bro health insurance broker and health insurance carrier, they'll be able to assure you that the insurance that you're offering does meet that MEC requirement. There is also what's known as minimum value. Um, so again, this is all in terms of the health plan that you're offering itself. Um, it needs to provide at least and pay for at least 60% of the covered benefits. Um, some of you may be familiar with some, some rebate checks that have come over from time to time. So um, 
in accordance with the ACA, when an insurer pays, you know, applies a certain less than a certain percentage of premiums to actual healthcare costs, uh, they are required to refund some of that money. So that's a discussion for a different day. But if you do get one of those, feel free to reach out to us and we can help guide you through it. And finally, affordability, which is really important to get a handle on to avoid those penalties we talked about a moment ago. So there are three safe harbors for avail for affordability. There's the W-2 safe harbor, there's the rate of pay safe harbor, and then there's the FPL or federal poverty line safe harbor. So um, the good news is, is that you can mix and match these if you have a varied workforce of um, some highly compensated employees, some moderately compensated employees and some low compensated employees, as long as you can find a safe harbor that fits each one of them, you're good. You don't, for instance, have to apply the W-2 safe harbor to your entire staff. And that's what the 1095C explains, kind of which, which safe harbor you're using for each employee. So let's go into these for a moment. First, the W-2 safe harbor. So what this looks at is box one of an employee's W-2. So again, that, that affordability measure for um, 2023 is 9.12%. So when you look at the annual employee cost of an employee only level plan for um, the coverage that they're offered, it doesn't matter what they actually signed up for. It's the lowest cost that, you, that is offered to them. That box one shouldn't exceed 9.12%. And again, apologies for the typo there. So in our example here, if an employee's W-2 box one wages, their earnings from you are $42,000 um, and they're offered coverage for 12 months of the year. The annual cost of that plan to the employee for the employee only lowest cost option should not exceed $3,830.40. Or if you divide that by 12 months, a 319 and 20 cent maximum employee contribution for the lowest level plan. Next is the rate of pay safe harbor. That's based on an employee's hourly rate or their monthly salary. So what you do to determine the, the rate of pay safe harbor is you take their hourly rate and multiply it by 130. Um, that gives you your, your marker. Um, in this case, a $15 per hour employee. When you take their rate times 130, you get 1,950. If you take 9.12% of that, that gives you a maximum of $177.84. So their out-of-pocket cost for the lowest cost option on your health insurance offering should not exceed that number. Uh, if it falls under that, then it's an affordable offer. If you have a salaried employee, again, you're going to take that monthly gross salary. So in our example here, that's $3,000. For that $3,000 a month employee, their offer and their cost should not exceed $273.60. And then finally is the federal poverty line. Um, that one I would say is probably the most difficult unless you're really heavily subsidizing uh, the insurance costs for your employees. So it's based on the employee's annual household income. Um, and this is a number that varies every year for 2023. The federal poverty line measure is one hundred ten dollars and eighty one cents. Um, so, the cost to the employee on a monthly basis would have to fall below that number to be considered affordable under the FPL safe harbor. So, in our examples here, we were multiplying by nine point one two percent. That's for compliance for twenty twenty three, and would be reflected on your forms that you file by March of next year. To be in compliance during the 2024 calendar year, as we said before, that number is going to be going all the way down, you know, about a, a half a percentage point to 8.39%. So um, those numbers are going to change and change fairly significantly, um, which may affect your benefits planning for the next year. All right, so let's talk about 1095C. So this is the employee statement. This is what you need to provide to your benefits eligible employees. There are three basic parts to the 1095C. Part one is the 
employee information, as well as your business's information. Part two deals with the offer of coverage um, and whether or not they accepted it, and if not, what affordability threshold is being used. And then part three is generally used for self-funded plans, but talks about additional covered individuals. A couple of, of new things from the last couple of years is that um, there is now a section that includes the employee's age on January 1st of the previous year, as well as your respective group health plans start month. In certain cases, especially for those with individual coverage HRAs, which we can talk about offline, um, you are required to also include the employee's home zip code. Um, the age is also only pertinent for those of you using independent individual coverage HRAs. Um, if you're not familiar with those, uh, we do have some information about them. We can be happy to send that along. Um, I will say for any convenience they provide in terms of giving flexibility to your employees to get health coverage on their own and, and you providing a monthly stipend for that, it does make the filing of ACA forms very, very complex. So in addition to having to include the employee's age and their zip code, um, you also have to, the affordability is based on the lowest cost silver level plan in their home zip code, which can vary within a state several times over. It can vary city by city. So um, ACA compliance is very tricky if you have a, a NICRA plan. Um, so you'll want to make sure if you're considering it uh, that you factor in what ACA compliance is going to look like for you. All right, so part two is really where the calculations and, and the data comes into play. So line 14 is going to have a code, generally starts with the number one followed by a letter. And that is going to state what kind of offer you made to your employee, either that you didn't make an offer to them, that you made one to employee only, that you made one that may have met, met um, minimum value, but not MEC, that you offered coverage to them and their spouse, but not others, or that you provided coverage to all covered, provided coverage, an offer of coverage to all covered individuals. Line two is gonna be affordability. So line two is, is gonna have a dollar amount on it. So what will be reflected there is based on your, the benefit plans you have in, in the system, the lowest ACA approved plan and what the employee only out of pocket costs would have been for the employee. So again, let's say, you know, it's Paul and he signs up for the family plan which costs $800 a month. But if Paul wanted, he could have signed up just for himself and that coverage would have been $100 a month. This line is going to reflect the $100 offer, not the $800 plan that Paul actually signed up for. Line 16, the third section is going to basically tell the government what the employee did with that offer. Um, if they, and this will be a, a code starting with a two followed by a, a letter, um, this will indicate that either the employee received insurance through you, the employer, um, or if they didn't, it'll state, you know, if applicable, how that was deemed affordable based on those safe harbors we talked about before. So here, I'm not going to go each over each and every one of these for the sake of time, but um, a lot of times you'll see 1A. That means that you made a, a full qualifying offer. Um, that's that's great. Um, and then we'll be sending a copy of the slide so you can look over each of these on, on your own time. But um, the most common would be 1A, that you sent the qualifying offer. If you did not offer coverage, something you want to be on the lookout for, if you um, are reviewing 1095s as that 1H, um, that means that you did not offer coverage. There could be a good reason for that. It might be that they uh, 
um, were no longer employed by you or weren't yet employed by you, that they were in a waiting period, whatever it may be, but definitely keep your eyes peeled for, for 1H as you want to make sure that that um, is correct and makes sense. You will see here highlighted, if you do have an individual coverage HRA, there are specific codes for that. Those are new within the last couple of years. Again, line 15 is, is going to reflect a dollar amount. Um, sometimes it will be blank if, if you have an affordability that qualifies for having that blank, but you want to check with um, your HR professional to make sure that it's accurate. Many times it, there will be a dollar amount on that line. And then line 16, again, is going to show what the employee did with that offer. If you had an employee that wasn't with you all 12 months of the year, um, let's say they started in June, those first five months, you're going to see a 2A. That just means that they weren't employed by you during those months. 2B would be in an instance where someone wasn't a full-time employee. They may have become a full-time employee uh, at some point during the year, but for the months that they weren't, or maybe they went down, um, you'd see a 2B there. 2C is what you're going to see when the employee was enrolled in coverage through you. So if you see something other than 2C for a month that you know that the employee was enrolled, you're going to want to question that for sure. Um, and then the other most common ones are going to be 2F, 2G, and 2H. So th that would be the W-2 safe harbor, the federal poverty level safe harbor, and the rate of pay safe harbor. So again, um, if you are an ISOLV client, the system is going to do that for you automatically. It's going to run all three safe harbors based on the payroll data that you have in the system and determine the most applicable safe harbor and put that on the form for you. If you see uh, line 16 blank, that should give you pause. Uh, that would mean that the offer potentially was not affordable. So you're going to want to look into that and maybe do some math or, or work with your trusted advisors to see um, uh, if there is a way to show that the offer was affordable. So um, a blank on line 16 should give you a bit of pause when you're reviewing the forms. Ten ninety four c so that's going to be a, a singular form. Uh, that does not get provided to employees. That gets submitted to the federal government along with copies of your 1095s. That is going to, part one, have the information about your business. Part two, if you're part of a control group and are, are filing a consolidated form with other entities, that information will be in part two. Uh, part three will be an attestation about whether or not you offered minimal, minimum essential coverage um, to your staff, what your full-time employee count was for each month of the year, um, as well as your total employee count for each month of the year. So this was just kind of be an attestation in terms of whether or not you met your requirements for offering affordable coverage to your employees during the previous calendar year. There are also a couple key line items there that you may want to double check versus line 18, which is going to state how many total 1095 C forms you're submitting with your 1094. So that should match up with the number that you're distributing to employees. Um, and then again, this minimum essential coverage offer indicator you're going to want to hopefully have that be yes for all 12 months. If you have any months that are checked off as no, you're going to want to look into that a little bit further. All right, so to kind of wind things up a little bit, really Affordable Care Act success, the key is maintaining accurate employee records. So um, whenever you do your open enrollment for anyone who is not going to be taking coverage through you, please, please, please collect a signed waiver from that person and keep it somewhere safe. Um, while the IRS has gotten better, it is not out of the ordinary for them to reach out to someone two or even three years after the fact to ask questions about their ACA filing or an employee's insurance coverage from, from, from years ago. So do please, I implore you, Collect waivers from anyone declining coverage. Make sure you're keeping good records of your, your payroll data and, and pay information, all of that. 
um, it is going to help you address any potential concerns uh, quickly and easily. A few quick, just re really quickly, a, a few key ISOLV reports that are ACA specific. The first is the large employer test. Um, I love this one. This is really great. So when you're determining whether or not you have to worry about everything we just talked about for the last 45 minutes, you need to determine whether or not you're an ethical large employer. So that count is always based on the previous calendar year. So if you're wondering, hey, am I going to need to do some filings this upcoming March? That would mean that you had to be compliance in 2023. Your uh, your ability to determine whether or not you're an ALE in 2023 is determined by your employee count in 2022. So um, what you would want to do in iSolved is run this applicable large employer test. You would put in, you know, in this case, 1-1-2022 to 12 2022 and this would give you a month-by-month -month breakdown of your full-time employees, your full-time equivalents, and your FTE count month-by-month, -month, along with a 12-month average. So in this example here, um, this employer has an FTE count of 53, so they do need to be in compliance with the ACA and file their forms uh, early next year. There is also um, this report as well, which is the ACA full-time look-back report. So this is going to tell you, you know, based on your look-back period, which employees you should be offering coverage to and which um, do not meet the hours threshold to need to be offered coverage. Um, in addition, assuming you've got all your benefit data and enrollment info in the system, it's going to also advise you based on that. So if there's someone who um, is showing that they were offered coverage and they're full-time, it'll say, good job, they're as they should be. If it's someone who doesn't seem to have been offered coverage but has met the full-time requirement, it's going to tell you to offer them coverage. Or if it's someone who is showing as offered coverage, um, but has dipped below that full-time equivalent, they'll say they may no longer be eligible and you may need to offer COBRA. And then lastly is an affordability uh, test that we have available. So you can run these based on all three safe harbors. Uh, it'll take the benefit information that we have in the system and has identified the lowest cost applicable option uh, against all of the payroll data that we have as the payroll provider and then let you know which employees uh, based on the safe harbor and based on the lowest cost option are coming up outside of the allowable percentage for the um, respective affordability mark. Um, in addition to pinpointing which employees are falling outside of that affordability window, it's also going to tell you um, if you want to become in compliance across the board on the safe harbor, what the total amount of wages you would need to increase these folks by to be in compliance as well as other options, um, subsidizing the benefit costs, what that would, what that expense would be, or um, if you were to just let it ride and each one of these unaffordable employees went to healthcare.gov and got coverage, what the penalty would be. So in this example here, you can see it'd be pretty expensive to face the penalty. Um, also, it'd be expensive to increase the wages, but if they subsidize the coverage some, um, they could be in full compliance. If you are an iSolved user, again, starting January 2nd, you should be able to log in. You will go to Client Management, ACA Setup Options, and ACA Forms Approval. You want to make sure you're selecting 2023 as your year. You'll click Preview to preview the report. You'll go through the forms and then click Approve. There'll be a, a secondary Are You Sure confirmation to approve the forms. Once you click that, you'll see the date reflected and those will be transmitted to our tax and benefit specialists who will then work on getting those forms produced and filed with the IRS. All right, so it looks like we do have some questions. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, so we'll get to as many of these can. How do you handle employees who switch back and forth from part-time to full-time? Well, I guess first you would determine um, if they're variable hour or not, if they're variable hour and you don't know what they're going to be, again, you do have up to 12 months to, to make that determination. Um, otherwise, you're going to want to measure in regards to whatever your measurement period is. So if, if you are hiring them on a full-time basis, you'll want to extend the benefits offered to them. And then for the extent of the measurement period, once you reach the end of your measurement period, 
for your open enrollment time, you'll want to look back and see how many hours they worked on average. And then that would determine whether or not they're going to be offered coverage in the, the following stability period. Do you count someone who has health care and works under a 30, 130 hours as full-time or part-time? So if you're offering them coverage, but they're, they're part-time, then you don't have to count them as full-time based on um, based on the ACA rules. Let's see a few more here while we've got a couple minutes. Can you repeat the new headcount requirement? How many employees do you need to have to require to file ACA? Sure. So you're going to look at the previous calendar year. So if you're concerned about maybe having to be in compliance in 2024, you're going to look at this year. So you're going to look at your your January to December employee count numbers. If you're on ISOL, definitely use that applicable large employer test. Um, and if that number is is over 50 full-time equivalents, then you're over. If it's under, then, you, then you're good to go. Uh, if you're on another payroll platform, you may want to see if they have something similar in terms of a report. Otherwise, you're you're counting all your full-time employees as one and taking all your part-time employees, adding up their hours, um, and then dividing to come up with your average number. Let's see. Can you email the 1095Cs to employees or does it have to be mailed hand delivered? So it's similar to the W-2s. You do need, they can be electronically delivered, but you would need to have um, the employee sign off that they wish to have electronic delivery of those, very similar to the W-2s. So they would have to sign off on, on electronic delivery. Do you get the penalty if you offer benefits, the employee declined them, and then applied for and receives Medicaid? No. So again, really crucial that you hang on to those waivers. If you can prove that you made an affordable offer, you will not be subject to a penalty. Uh, let's see. Got a lot of really good questions here, so I'm trying to find the, the best that aren't too, too specific. How do we submit these digitally to the IRS? Um, so you want to go to irs.gov if you if you do this in-house, if you do this manually. Um, uh, my heart goes out to you if you do. If you are working with MP um, or working with a, another provider who's helping you manage this, then they should be able to file electronically for you. Um, similar to how they file your 941s and other payroll tax forms. Um, MP does the electronic filing. Um, if you are doing it yourself, you're, you're going to want to go to irs.gov um, and get full instructions for submitting digitally to them directly. If you have a broker, should the broker be helping run the reporting? Um, you know, every broker is different. Um, some of them have different you know, ACA knowledge, some of them have different technical capabilities, some of them have systems, some of them have access to your payroll data, some do not. Um, it really depends on the broker and, um, you know, where, you know, what's part of their services, what they have access to, um, and, and how much access you want to give them to things. Um, they sh should certainly be able to advise you a little bit. If you are an HR services client with us, our HR partners are equipped and we'll bring in the team as needed to, to help advise on ACA matters, but um, uh, that that varies broker by broker. ACA is based on the lowest level of individual coverage offered only, correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, yes, we will be sending a recorded version of the webinar. <laughs> Uh, confirmation, yes. For 2023 1095C reporting, you look back to the 2022 data to determine whether or not you're an ALE. That is correct. So, you know, during the pandemic and unfortunate downturns in the economy as a result, you do have some businesses that have varied back and forth who were ALEs prior to the pandemic, had to do a major reduction in force. So maybe got a year or two of relief, um, but are now staffing back up and are ALEs again. So you do want to take a look at those numbers, especially if you're you hover around that 50 employee mark.
All right. And then one last question we'll get to here. If the employee was part-time during the measurement period, but full-time in the stability period, do they get a 1095C? So they wouldn't get a 1095C necessarily. Um, if you did a formal change in their status. So if it isn't someone who just happened to work more hours, but is doing the same job, um, they would be part-time for the remainder of the stability period. They would not get a 1095C. But if you have someone who was a part-time worker, but you promote them to a full-time position, in those instances, you should bump them to a full-time employee and offer them benefits as you would to other full-time employees. It's it's really more the the folks that are, are trickier that you know their, their hours may fluctuate really close to that, um, that you'd be more protected by the stability period. So I think those are the, the questions that we have time to get to here. I did see a note. It looks like we have some some um, fancy new new features and functionality for ACA and iSolved in the coming year. So looking forward to sending along an update of that. Uh, the approval screen I'm hearing from our benefit specialist has been updated. Uh, looks, looks really slick, a lot more um, user friendly. Um, so, ISOLV has done a fantastic job really from the, the start of the ACA mandate in, in issuing correct and, and easy to review and approve data and accurate data for ACA purposes. And so I'm um, looking forward to the new approval screen and we'll, we'll definitely update the slides with, with these new, new graphics. They look fantastic. But um, other than that, we are good to go. I wish you luck with your Affordable Care Act filing for the 2023 calendar year. And if you have questions or if we can be of assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. We, we love helping clients with this really important and crucial filing. All right, thank you, Paul. To learn more about MP's full service solutions for 2023 and more, I just dropped a link in the chat that will connect you with an MP team member. You can also visit our website at mp-hr.com for more information. Be sure to join us for an, our upcoming webinar a 2023 HR year in review and a glance into 2024. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out a recording for today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thank you for joining us and have a terrific day.